who were in. Um, anyhow, I'll, 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 I won't go further. I want to give other people a chance to talk. Yeah, sure. I would love to hear more about it. Well, I think we're close to the time that we're going to start. Now, let me apologize uh, immediately. If at any point the internet goes out, if the Wi-Fi service goes out, I will just come back and continue to the best of my ability, okay? All right. Sounds, so, sounds like a plan. I say we wait yeah. just a couple more minutes and sure. then uh, we'll get started. Life is capricious, very fickle. We all understand that and the internet is you know, equally so. Yeah. So, you know, with only five people, we don't have to have, let's just, I'm going to look at the other options here. Uh, Stop, Stop experimenting. <laughs> so like this looks better to me because you are the speaker and, you know, uh, people like to see your face, you know, and if we get a whole bunch more people in, we'll, we'll put you back on the grid. Does that sound okay? The simultaneous framing is just perfect. I still think it's perfect. It's very democratic. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> How she doesn't want to see you drinking and fidgeting. That's all it is. You want to avoid that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, okay, then curtail. See, I have an idea. Get a sippy cup, okay? Get a red cup, get a straw, and put your mysterious beverage inside there, that elixir that keeps you happy, mm -hmm. that ambrosial beverage. Put it inside there, and then nobody has to know that you're having any spirits. How do you do the squares? Where do you go down here to... To have this frames. We don't touch anything. We don't okay. ask. Oh, I'm not going to touch anything. I'm, <laughs> I'm asking him. <laughs> don't touch anything. Which, what do you want? What do you need? No, I want you to tell me, how do you get people like in the windows like that? Is there anything down here that you touch to do that? Uh, your view. You can, you can select your view. I think it's on the top. Top right. Yeah. It looks like mm. a little machine. Oh, thing. I see it. You say it now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Only because I have uh, meetings like this with my church and we haven't, you know, I'm learning this. So we just go one on one and he's, this is nice. I like this because you can Hello, see everything. Hello. Hello, your microphone has to be turned on. You, you can't hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. No, I hear you, Edna. I was talking to Nancy. Hi. Oh, hi. You want me to unmute? Most of the time they no, want people no, muting this minute they come in. No, oh, this is the this is a progressive Zoom. Yeah. Usually, unless it's a class, they want you muting the minute you come in, you know, because it's all oh. this background noise and all this. This is a community, <laughs> exactly. It's a community. <laughs> yeah. I believe in the communal approach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so James, yeah, it is my contention that we should start. What do you think? I don't think we should penalize folks for coming in early. Yeah, sure. Hold on one second. Yeah, it was 607 too. So it's, yeah, exactly. it's past it's, the 605 courtesy five exactly. minutes. Exactly. Right. Well, I mean, once Bob starts, I think you should, people should mute, to be honest. Um, yeah, so yeah. Have the respect sure, of course. For I mean, there's some background music where I am, and I, I don't, you know. Right. But I am going to ask you like, guys. It's 80s stuff, and I love it, but it's not going to yes. go with it. I thought it maybe, maybe it was Wagner's The Ring cycle. Okay, let's see here. That was 80s. <laughs> okay, 80s. The different 80s. 1980s, 1980s. It's okay. a little before my time. All uh, right. Anyway. So here we go. I'll introduce you and then we'll get going, okay? Sure. All right. Let's see here. That's relaxing class. Okay. So I want to welcome everybody out to the uh, to our February meeting of the New York Browning Society 2022. Uh, we have a fantastic speaker lined up for today. Uh, he's been with us over the last few seasons. Uh, some of the more memorable events at the National Arts Club uh, where we had the opportunity to invite and uh, have uh, children from the local high schools participate. Uh, they always look forward to seeing Bob speak. Uh, hopefully in the future, we will be able to do that again uh, as well. Uh, Bob McNeil, he's a writer, editor, cartoonist, and spoken word artist. He's the author of Verses of Realness, available at undergroundbooks.org. Hal Sierowitz, a former Queens Poet Laureate, called the book a fantastic trip to the mind of a poet who doesn't flinch at the truth. Among Bob's recent accomplishments, he found working on lyrics of mature hearts to be a humbling experience because of the anthology's talented contributors Copies of that collection are available uh, wherever better books are sold. Lyrics of Mature Hearts, a poetry anthology. So without further ado, we want to welcome our speaker, Bob, McNe Bob McNeil, for his talk entitled Verses, 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 Injustice, Words of Protest 
from Elizabeth Barrett Browning and other democracy speaker. Uh, round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Bob McNeil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, let's give James Browning Keppel and the New York Browning Society a round of applause for making this program possible. Come on, guys. Is that the best you can do? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Furthermore, folks in the audience, give yourselves a round of applause for supporting the arts, please. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm holding my now, smartphone. That's so one. I'm sorry. I just said I I'm holding my see. smartphone. So I have to do the jazz clap with one or the the jazz oh, clap yeah, okay. with one hand. Right, like the beatniks. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> yeah. And I can't see Nancy in the view. I can't see her up there. That's fine. Um, Let's continue. I, right. So now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am Bob McNeil. I will humbly serve as your featured guest speaker. Throughout this program, you will hear poetical and historical information. Case in point, given Elizabeth Barrett Browning's wealth from her family's plantation that used slaves, she was an unexpected proponent for the freedom of black people. Nonetheless, she dedicated her muse to a revolutionary cause in a couple of meritorious poems titled A Curse for a Nation and The Runaway Slave at Pilgrim's Point. I will share the aforesaid poems as well as other cause-oriented compositions by Elizabeth. Additionally, aside from the Victorian writer's work, this program acknowledges other important figures who shared similar views on the subject of oppression. Once again, this poem is titled, A Curse for a Nation. I heard an angel speak last night and he said, write. Write a nation's curse for me and send it over the Western Sea. I fought it, taking up the word. Not so, my lord. If curses must be, choose another to send thy curse against my brother. For I am bound by gratitude, by love and blood to brothers of mine across the sea who stretch out kindly hands to me. Therefore, the voice said, shalt thou write my curse tonight. From the summits of love, a curse is driven as lightning is from the tops of heaven. Not so, I answered evermore. My heart is sore for my own man's sins, for little feet of children bleeding along the street, for parked up honors that gainsay the right of way, for almsgiving through a door that is not open enough for two friends to kiss, for freedom of love, which abates beyond the straits, for patriot virtue starved as vice on self-praise, self-interest and suspicion. For an oligarchic parliament and bribes well meant, what curse to another land assign when heavy sold for the sins of mine? Therefore the voice said, shalt thou write my curse tonight, because thou hast strength to see and hate a foul thing done within thy gate. Not so, I answered once again, to curse choose men, for I, a woman, have only known how the heart melts and the tears run down. Therefore, the voice said, shalt thou write my curse tonight? Some women weep and curse, I say, and no one marvels night and day. And thou shalt take their part tonight. Weep and write. A curse from the depths of womanhood is very salt and bitter and good. So thus I wrote and mourned indeed what all may read. And thus, as was enjoined on me, I send it over the Western Sea, the curse. Because ye have broken your own chain with a strain of brave men climbing a nation's height, yet thence bear down with brand and thong on souls of others for this wrong. This is the curse, right? Because yourselves are standing straight in the state of freedom's foremost acolyte, yet keep calm footing all the time on writhing bond slaves for this crime, this is the curse, right? Because ye prosper in God's name with a claim to honor in the old world sight, yet do the fiends work perfectly in strangling martyrs for this lie. 
This is the curse. Right. Ye shall watch while kings conspire around the people's smoldering fire and warm for your part shall never dare. Oh, shame to utter the thought into flame which burns at your heart. This is the curse. Right. Ye shall watch while nations strive with bloodhounds die or survive, drop faint from their jaws or throttle them backward to death and only under your breath shall favor the cause. This is the curse. Right. Ye shall watch while strong men draw the nets of feudal law to strangle the weak and counting the sin for a sin, your soul shall be sadder within than the word ye shall speak. This is the curse, right? When good men are praying erect, that Christ may avenge his elect and deliver the earth, the prayer in your ears said blow shall sound like the tramp of a foe that's driving you forth. This is the curse, right? When wise men give you their praise, they shall praise in the heat of the phrase as if carried too far. When ye boast your own charters kept true, ye shall blush for the thing which ye do. Derives what ye are. This is the curse. Right. When fools cast haunts at your gate, your scorn ye shall somewhat abate as ye look o'er the wall for your conscience, tradition, and name explode with a deadlier blame than the worst of them all. This is the curse, right? Go wherever ill deed shall be done. Go plant your flag in the sun beside the ill doers and recoil from clenching the curse as God's witnessing universe with a curse of yours. This is the curse, right? Thank you. Thank you. You know, to get into character, I shaved my mustache and ate scones. That's a fact. True story. <laughs> um, question. All jokes aside, do you think the poem effectively castigates a nation known for whipping, raping, mutilating, and destroying the cultures of African slaves? I want your input at this point. So please, let's engage. I want to hear your viewpoint. Anyone? Don't answer all at once now. I think it does. OK. Ex I think it elaborate. does. Um, I think it does in, well, in the language and context Mm -hmm. of the time it's very sharp it's very yes uh yeah i mean the just the use of the word curse right you know and right which at that time really meant something and right curse and right. right and the repetition and the emphatic yes. repetition yes. um definitely definitely uh i i think when i say for the times what's what's very interesting is um now i, I don't know i do know i i know some of elizabeth barrett browning's uh, background but i don't um, I don't know, you said that her family did own slaves? Yes, absolutely, they had yeah. a plantation, but she was adamantly yeah. against the idea. Right, yeah, um, it's, I think that, what I like about it is about the poem that you do not find in the milder uh, sort of regrets of this, the quote, necessary evil, unquote, mm -hmm. that you heard plantation owners often, you know, lament. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and you're thinking, if it's evil, why is it necessary? Um, and Understood. Unfortunately, I can't hear you. Oh, okay, can you hear me now? No, 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 I'm sorry. The young lady was speaking. Nancy was speaking. Oh, she's still. Yes. Nancy? Sorry, Nancy, I can't hear you. Yeah, you I'm sorry. Off. I had a, yeah. I had, yes, what happened? I had a call coming through that ended up being a scam. And so I silenced it. Um, so, um, but I, what I was thinking of is that for someone who was in this situation, you know, living on a plantation with slaves and, um, I, you know, I've sometimes, I teach political science and I've sometimes said to my students, it's, it's not a great parallel, but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a bad parallel, but it's the only one I can think of is that we, 
in more distant ways now say, you know, if in fact we're using more than our share of the world's resources, which one could argue we are, <clears throat> and if over time that's going to mean extreme food scarcities and that people in the global south are going to be starving and, you know, water shortages and all these things, 300 years from now, if the planet's still around, are people going to say, how could people in, you know, the global north do this to other people? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we even say, oh, we are, we're wasteful people. We consume too much, but we don't really stop because mm -hmm. we're in this, we're in this net somehow. Right, the eye of the storm, uh, if you will. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And what I, what I admire about Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poem is that I think she takes a huge step toward break, trying to break out of that net, even though she's still in it. Exactly. You know, right, and, by and rebelling that, against her family and tradition. Right. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Anybody else briefly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I thought it was very effective, and I I noted uh, some techniques that uh, her husband uses in Love Among the Ruins. That that mm -hmm. you we have a certain focus, and all of a sudden it rapidly shifts to something else, and you have right. to find your grounding, and it, and it does that. You know, it keeps punching away in in, in that fashion. And so I think it's uh, timeless. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. And anybody want to comment on my attempt at an English accent? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's I proceed. Thought, excuse me. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, can I just mention one thing? Um, sure. I thought the English accent was, was wonderful. I mean, it was exact, it was absolutely impeccable. Um, I'm curious as to what it would sound like if you read it in your own voice. Oh, if it would be, be different. Sorry? Oh, it'd be dreadful. <laughs> that means no, saving a lot of time right wonderful. now. You have a wonderful voice. You have a well, wonderful voice. You'll hear I, that I, later I, on in other poems. Okay. Yeah. And the real reason I say that is that, you no, know, I felt it was very effective. And mm. yet I sometimes wonder um, I've heard this happen with with women who will sing what I call real alpha songs, like like mm -hmm. cowboy songs and and uh, um, uh, ranching songs and things, but in some who try to kind of imitate the more masculine voice and tone, and some who just sing it in their own voices, mm -hmm. and surprisingly, the lyric voice carries it. The right. nuance is very powerful, and I just wonder, you know, how it would be. To hear you read it in your own voice, the the accent was impeccable, as I said. Thank but you. I just really would be very curious about that. Okay, you're going to hear other pieces, and I'm going to utilize my voice, and I will okay. give it back to the person <laughs> I borrowed it from at some point. <laughs> okay, awesome. sounds good. Okay, very good. Well, let's see now. Where are we? We are now up to this. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, an African-American abolitionist, suffragist, poet, teacher, public speaker, and writer, saw the evil of a duplicitous nation that called itself democratic, but engaged in tyranny. Her poem, The Slave Auction, expresses the horrors very well. A sale began here. Young girls were there, defenseless in their wretchedness, who stifled sobs of deep despair revealed their anguish and distress. And mothers stood with streaming eyes and saw their dearest children sold. Unheeded rose their bitter cries while tyrants bartered them for gold. And woman with her love and truth for these in sable forms made well, gazed on the husband of her youth with anguish, none may paint or tell. And men whose sole crime was their hue, the impress of their maker's hand, and frail and shrinking children too, were gathered in that mournful band. Ye who have laid your love to rest and wept above their lifeless clay, know not the anguish of that breast whose loved are rudely torn away. Ye may not know how desolate are bosoms rudely forced apart and how a dull and heavy weight will press the life drops from the heart. Thank you. The idea 
of racial appropriation being offensive was non-existent in the Victorian age. Knowing this, some of my contemporaries criticized Elizabeth's poem, The Runaway Slave at Pilgrim's Point, because she did not truly understand the plight of black slaves. There is some truth to that argument. I, not being an apologist, must state some of the lines in that verse are highly objectionable. Written from the point of view of a black woman who bore the child of her master, an ignominious rapist, the composition makes readers realize the cruelness of slavery. This is an excerpt from Elizabeth's oft criticized but well-meaning poem. I see you staring in my face. I know you staring, shrinking back. Ye are born of the Washington race. And this land is the free America. And this mark on my wrist, I prove what I say. Ropes tied me up here to the flogging plates. You think I shriek then? Not a sound, a hum as a gourd hangs in the sun. I only cursed them all around as softly as I might have done my very own child. From these sands up to the mountains, lift your hands, old slaves, and end what I've begun. Whips, curses, these must answer those. For in this union, you have set two kinds of men in adverse foes, each loathing each and all forget the seven wounds in Christ's body fair. While he sees gaping everywhere our countless wounds that pay no debt. Our wounds are different. Your white men are after all, not gods indeed, not able to make Christ again do good with bleeding. We who bleed stand off. We help not in our loss. We are too heavy for our cross and fall and crush you and your seed. I fall, I swoon, I look at the sky. The clouds are breaking on my brain, floating along as if I should die of liberty's exquisite pain. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me just get a moment here. If Elizabeth Browning's statement, true knowledge comes only through suffering, then Frederick Douglass was a polymath. As a slave, he suffered indeed. Thankfully, he escaped his bondage. Armed with experience and wisdom, he fought for abolitionism. His justified anger resides in this speech. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sound of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass fronted impudence, your shout of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. Thank you. I know this program is supposed to use verses, but that speech has all the lyricism of any prose poem. Do you guys agree? I would love to hear your opinions. Anybody? Let me hear from some other folks. Anybody want to engage? Young lady? So, anybody else want to engage? <laughs> uh, Frederick Douglass obviously is an immaculate uh, speaker and writer. Um, so yes. that's not really the question at hand. 
my question was thus uh well and i usually save these towards the end but um yes, I see the herbs having a drink so i have one as well <laughs> i envy you guys i have but to my, say so the the one the one cab the one the one little point that i wanted to bring out in regards to the before the Frederick Douglass, in, in which you were saying that Elizabeth was very criticized, and then I suppose this yes. is in, in modern times. Yes. For, first of all, we have to say that one, she did not live on a slave plantation. Oh, no. She yes. she had no idea of any of the any of the uh, the events about uh, what her her family had done in the past. She uh, was not a part of that uh, or supported that in any way. No, I know. Um, and as Elizabeth was one of the first, um, you know, uh, popular abolitionists. And feminists at that time, she was also the top selling poet at that time. Oh, absolutely. So her voice in Pilgrim Point was a giant call to show light on the plight of the slaves. Uh, thus, the refrain, if you remember, it was right because yes. no one else was writing about it. And she That's had the enough. balls and the courage to stand up and saying that this is something that mattered. And it was right. that Pilgrim Point that really rolled into a lot of this other stuff. So it's easy to criticize someone in the modern and say, well, Elizabeth couldn't have done this or, but the truth is if Elizabeth wouldn't have stood up and said what she said, then, you know, it would have, I mean, it was just a big, it was a, it was a big turning point in that movement with that poem. So I think that no, she should be given, be given some, some credit as opposed to some criticism. That's all. Okay. But we're offering both sides and that's a very good point. I have to concede that. Anybody else want to uh, jump in? Okay. So let's take it from there. Let's move yeah, on. Yeah, I think I, yes. I was just going to say that. Oh yes, the please. Thing is, I think about the um, the criticism. I take criticism as something like this, not so much criticism of her intent, but more situating it within context. Mm -hmm. You know, that I mean, I think that that is valid, so that we see also uh, that what she, as as James, I think that's it, uh, yeah. Um, no, her, no, the, the gentleman who just spoke, mm -hmm. that you're right, for, a, for any time, but particularly for her time, what she did was incredibly pioneering and oh, absolutely. radical. Um, it, it's, it, as, as was, you know, Aura Lee and, um, you know, the, uh, so much of what she wrote, mm -hmm. but putting it within the context for someone who might not see it as radical as it was, really. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the point of what we might call a, a critique, maybe more than a criticism, you know, Understood. sort of add that. Or just revisionist history. Okay. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, which I, I sincerely hope I'll never be accused of at all. Um, hold on for one moment. Let me see where we are in our program. Okay. Now, the Brownings and John Greenleaf Whittier were friends. They also shared a mutual hatred for slavery. John's poem, Astria at the Capitol, proves this fact. When first I saw our banner wave above the nation's council hall, I heard beneath its marble wall the clanking fetters of the slave. In the foul marketplace I stood and saw the Christian mother sold and childhood with its locks of gold, blue-eyed and fair with Saxon blood. I shut my eyes. I held my breath and smothering down the wrath and shame that set my northern blood aflame, stood silent. Where to speak was death. Beside me gloomed the prison cell where wasted wine and slow decline. For uttering simple words of mine, and loving freedom all too well. The flag that floated from the dome flapped menace in the morning air. I stood a peril stranger where the human broker made his home. For crime was virtue, gown and sword and law, their threefold sanction gave, and to the quarry of the slave went hawking with their symbol bird. On the oppressor side was power, and yet I knew that every wrong, however old, however strong, but waited God's avenging hour. I knew that truth would crush the lie. Somehow, sometime the end would be. Yet scarcely dared I hope to see the triumph with my mortal eye. But now I see it in the sun. A free flag floats from yonder dome and at the nation's hearth and home, 
the justice long delayed is done. That is, we hoped, in calm of prayer, the message of deliverance comes, but herald by roll of drums on waves of battle troubled air, with sounds that madden and appall, the song that Bethlehem shepherds knew, the harp of David melting through the demon agonies of Saul. Not as we hoped, but what are we? Above our broken dreams and plans, God lays with wiser hand than man's the cornerstones of liberty. I cavil not with him. The voice that freedom's blessed gospel tells is sweet to me as silver bells. Rejoicing, yea, I will rejoice. Dear friends still toiling in the sun, ye dearer ones who gone before are watching from the eternal shore, the slow work by your hands begun. Rejoice with me, the chastening rod blossoms with love. The furnace heat grows cool beneath his blessed feet, whose form is as the son of God. Rejoice, our Mora's bitter springs are sweetened on our ground of grief. Rise day by day in strong relief, the prophecies of better things. Rejoice in hope, the day and night are one with God and one with them who see by faith the cloudy hem of judgment fringed with mercy's light. Thank you. Thank you yet again. You're too kind. Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, truth outlives pain as the soul does life. There is a lot of truth in Langston Hughes' poem, Democracy. Democracy will not come today, this year, nor ever through compromise and fear. I have as much right as the other fellow has to stand on my two feet and own the land. I tire so of hearing people say, let things take their course. Tomorrow is another day. I do not need my freedom when I'm dead. I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Freedom is a strong seed planted in a great need. I live here too. I want freedom, just as you. Again, thank you. Thank you, folks. All right, where are we now? Um, the American sculptor, Hiram Powers and his family, were among the few intimate friends of the Brownings during their first years in Florence. Moved by Hiram's sculpture, the Greek slave, Elizabeth wrote the following poem bearing the same title. They say, ideal beauty cannot enter the house of anguish. On the threshold stands an alien image within shackled hands called the Greek slave, as if the artist meant her, that passionless perfection which he lent her, shadowed, not darkened, where the sill expands, to so confront man's crimes in different lands, with man's ideal sense, pierce to the center, art's fiery finger, and break up ere long the serfdom of this world. Appeal, fair stone, from God's pure heights of beauty against man's wrong. Catch up in thy divine face, not alone. East griefs, but west, and strike and shame the strong by thunders of white silence overthrown. Thank you again. Now, let me ask, are you guys familiar with the statue of the Greek slave? Are you guys familiar? Anybody? No? Really? Okay. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, piece of art. On one hand, the nude image is attractive, but in contrast, ugly shackles bind her. Okay, so in lieu of obtaining the image on the net, James is going to imitate it right now, right, James? James, are you going to imitate the Greek statue? James. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, are you going to imitate the Greek statue right now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we rehearsed, right? Didn't we rehearse it that way? Okay. <laughs> All right. 
So with that said, let's move on. There, ah, very good. Yes. Thank you, James. We did not rehearse that. No, we did not. Of course not. It's called a joke. Okay. okay. But anyway, uh, it's a beautiful statue, but obviously the disturbing aspect is the fact that this poor young lady has been enshackled by the oppressive system of that time. Very good, James. Well done. Cheers. Now, if you could just uh, make the screen go back to the way it was. Perfect. Okay. That works out perfectly. Thank you, James. Uh, let's see now. Now, although Spaniards in Puerto Rico conquered, enslaved, and through torture as well as diseases, drove the Taino Indians to near extinction, those indigenous voices live on in folk tales, songs, and poems. That form of immortality through art reminds me of this Elizabeth Barrett Browning quote, when the dust of death has choked a great man's voice, the common words he said turn oracles, the common thoughts he yoked like horses, draw like griffins. Edna Garcia, novelist and poet, gives those Taino people life again through words. Let's take a moment to listen. Edna, are you ready? Come on, let's give Edna a round of applause, folks. Come on. Thank you. Get an opportunity to hear another voice better than mine. Um, this poem is called Colibri, which means hummingbird in Spanish. Uh, it was written by a former lawyer and poet, Martin Espada, um, and he addresses the colonization of uh, Puerto Rican people. Okay. In Hayuya, that is the name of a town in Puerto Rico. In Hayuya, the lizard scatters like a fleet of green canoes before the invader. The Spanish conquer with iron and words. Taino, for the people who took life from the platanos in the trees, those multiple green fingers curling around on seen spheres, who left the rock carvings of eyes and mouth in perfect circles of amazement. So the hummingbird was Kristen Colibri. Now the colibri darts and bangs between the white walls of the hacienda, erasing Taino heart frantic as if, as if hearing the bellowing god of gunpowder for the first time. The colibri becomes pure stillness, sees in the paralysis of the prey when your hands cup the bird and lifting throughout the red shutters of the window where he disappears into a paradise of sky, a nightfall of singing frogs, if only history were like your hands. Thank you. <laughs> you want me to uh, uh, share my second poem? Yes, by all means. Oh, okay. A second poem that I have is by, um, I really like this one, is by um, Rick Kearns. He's a poet and a freelance writer, a musician uh, who lives in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And he called it, that was it, the missing Taino. It is not easy for me to say I am a stranger in this wide world, what I am. I awoke one day, rainbow Boricua white boy floating in a suburb, feeling the need to explode, looking for the right mirror and none of the mainstream labels seemed to fit. I found the marrow of the matter solely by chance. My white ancestors, Scots, German, Irish, helped build this glorious monstrosity, giving us more free time and faster transportation, quicker communication, so we can send words to more people we will never meet and help each other build more walls, more privacy until we are all completely alone together. They are my people too. 
The roots of my tree also go back to España. Gypsy mother, Roman father of passionate faith and dignity and blinding greed. Conquistadors took Taino African concubines and begat Puerto Rico, reinforcing the notion that slavery begins at home and love, rage, suppression, and servitude begat farmers who lived in music and the heat of tropical sunny colonial slavery with a twist. They are my family as well. And I walk among these cousins apart and watching a visitor in somebody else's museum. Not to say that there were not connections there where are many, many of great strengths. No, no, nothing so simple as all that. I often felt I was inside a cave, at home in subways, alleys, basements, dark forests. None of this had a name until the family secret was accidentally released. I always want the stories. Impossibly curious 12 year olds always wanting family stories. Quiz my grandparents, uncles, cousins, and my beleaguered parents until one day, my mother shot a laser through the fog. Well, mijo, my beloved mother conceded, yes, hijo, your abuelo's family had Taino blood, but it's so far back, so far away. The Tainos are extinct, mijo. Our family is from Spain. That was it. That made sense. All of a sudden, it had a name. It had a name. Taino, Taino. I would mutter to myself, and it remained my secret. I knew what was in the books. The word in the books was extinct. Death of disease and genocide. And I knew all that. But Taino did not feel dead to me. Taino ancestors explain my love for the earth in a way that cannot be translated into English or Spanish. These epiphanies came in waves, knocked me out of linear language, expression, and state just below the surface. Then the waves came again. Many years later, I rode in a truck, in a train, in a subway, merged into the light, out of the cave into the East Harlem, Barrio Fifth Avenue, the poor end of Museum Row and El Museo del Barrio. Taino celebration relation to see dancers and photos, sacred objects and Taino faces. It was uplifting and confusing, causing outrageous battle with my linear mind telling me, look at your Irish friend and your Celtic name and look in the mirror, look in the mirror. And I caught my reflection in the glass of a case surrounding a semi. And I saw myself smiling. This is it, Taino, you make sense. This is it, my secret no longer, this is it the missing piece of my puzzle, and I am complete. I am complete. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very well done. Very well done. Come on, guys. You guys agree? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Edna, thank you for sharing those profound poetical words. I can see why you were a great high school teacher. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Now, centuries ago, during the Industrial Revolution, children learned different lessons. They worked harder than mules and endured abuse while others profited off their labor. Angered by the policies of factories and mines in England, Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote The Cry of the Children. This heart-wrenching excerpt, or excuse me, excerpt, uh, best expresses the writer's indignation. Do you hear the children weeping? 
and disproving. Oh, my brothers, what ye preach. For God's possible is taught by his world's loving and the children doubt of each. And well may the children weep before you. They are weary, uh, they run. They have never seen the sunshine nor the glory, which is brighter than the sun. They know the grief of man, but not the wisdom. They sink in man's despair without its calm. Are slaves without the liberty in Christum. Are martyrs by the pang without the palm. Are worn as if with age, yet unretrievingly. No dear remembrance keep or orphans of the earthly love and heavenly. Let them weep, let them weep. They look up with their pale and sunken faces and their look is dread to see, for they mind you of the angels in their places with eyes meant for deity. How long, they say, how long, O oh, cruel nation, will you stand to move the world on a child's heart? Stifle down with mailed heel its palpitation and tread onward to your throne amid the mocked. Our blood splashes upward, oh, our tyrants, and your purple shows your path. For the child's sob curses deeper in the silence than a strong man in his wrath. Thank you. Many people do not want certain historical atrocities taught in classrooms. These critics believe such lessons make students uncomfortable. However, the naysayers fail to realize no one designed the curriculum to shame any group. Quite simply, the data informs people about what took place throughout the world. Moreover, the information edifies generations about the dangers of repeating history. Aside from that, the students learn how to empathize with the plight of others. Elizabeth Barrett Browning understood the importance of didacticism. By using poetic words, she taught generations the gospel of love and respect for all people. That much needed lesson requires iteration every time prejudice in homes tries to indoctrinate young minds. Knowing full well that bias gets taught in homes, I wrote the following poem titled, Students of Their Insanity. The students' minds were pages awaiting moral text. What they got was acrimony's alphabet from adults. These adults felt A represented aversion on the last letter was for zealotry. The students' minds were pages awaiting moral text. What they got was lessons in antagonism's annals from bullies who beat them the way slaves got beaten and tortured them the way hostages got tortured. The students' minds were pages awaiting moral text. What they got was prejudice, tutoring them proprietarily. These days, the students are fluent in hate, possessing an old bigots, vulgarism. The students' minds were pages awaiting moral text. What they got was the globe's most itinerant pandemic beneath Afric, Asiatic, and Caucasic faces. The students' minds were pages awaiting moral text. What they got was a tassel-headed graduation and a welcome to the ever battlesome world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Give me a moment to catch my breath. <laughs> like a pedagogue, history teaches some hard lessons. That knowledge can help us rebuild this planetary abode. Perhaps by remembering these words from Elizabeth, we can make the world beautiful. Earth may him bitter, not remove, 
the love divinely given, and e'en that mortal grief shall prove the immortality of love and lead us nearer heaven. Again, I thank you. Thankfully, this sentiment of working towards the world's betterment through love is alive in a young poet named Amanda Gorman. These lines from The Hill We Climb prove that fact. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from our bronze pounded chests. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the wind swept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation in every corner called our country, our people, diverse and dutiful, will emerge battered, but beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh. In conclusion, I'm grateful that the New York Browning Society was brave enough to let an old social justice warrior like me share another poetic lecture. Furthermore, I'm grateful that you, the viewers, were brave enough to hear one modest man's take on history. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Bob, did, yes. Who wrote, who wrote that poem about students? Was that you or Edna? Uh, well, guilty as charged. It is I. And um, Underground Books oh, was <laughs> kind enough yeah. to publish this chapbook, Verses of Realness. Okay. Thank you. What did you think of it, sir? Hmm? What did you think of it, sir? I think it was to the point, crisp, clear, and vital. Very good. Thank you. Glad to hear that. Okay. Anyone else want to offer some feedback? I think that... Uh, yes. Your, your comment about history is, is very well taken. And I think that um, when we... Well, I think... I don't know if it's you, the, the term reappraisal. Um, but when we go back and revisit... Um, and look at other aspects of history that have not been taught. Uh, it's not only the oppression, but figures in history that have been marginalized, that have not been uh, brought to their proper, um, their proper place, you know, recognition for, for various reasons. And, um, and it, what's, what I find very interesting when I bring those up is there are all sorts of reasons. They're obviously race, gender, uh, you know, that those are, those are some, um, and but what is amazing is how people who have been oppressed nevertheless um, achieved amazing things, oh, for which they were not recognized. And I think when we bring that up as, as well as the oppression, we also give people inspiration. I mean, a lot of people say that in today's world, people um, <laughs> they'll say that this generation doesn't really know what labor is you know when you think 200 300 years ago what it took to wash clothes what it took to and oh, even absolutely. for the well even for the privilege it was comfortable right. certainly compared to servants and slaves but um you know travel for example even if you could afford it you bumped along the prairie in a stagecoach for weeks you know knee to knee with the people it was not it was not pleasant people avoided travel if they could you know you You're didn't travel you i remember it very well yeah, and so I think that um, 
bringing, you know, bringing these aspects of history, not just the oppression, but also the achievement over in spite of oppression um, is amazing. I mean, it's beyond, it's just, it's, it's almost unfathomable. Um, there's a woman named Clara Brown who was born a slave and her family was sold away from her, but her, I think her second master must have been, um, what do they call it, um, bipolar or something, because uh, he, he made arrangements for their emancipation upon his death but he sold the family out from under them during his lifetime. And so when she was manumitted in the 1830s and in an effort to try to find her, or she didn't know where any of her children were and some were reported dead as was her husband, but there was one daughter that she kept trying to find and she thought she was in Colorado. So she joined a, um, a, uh, a, an expedition that was headed for the gold rush and became their cook and their laundress and you know and she ended up setting up the first uh, commercial laundry in Colorado she did finally reunite with her daughter in Iowa not in Colorado but in the meantime she helped many freed families after the civil war settled um, and uh, it was I mean not that much is known about her but she, it's it's an incredible story and, and that's there why it's our job to bring this information yeah, exactly to Right. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, not only the realities of the oppression, but how people manage to overcome that. And I think another thing that's important, people will ask, you know, to this day, how did Hitler come to power? Well, if you look at what Germany was like after World War One, and, you know, I know my students, some of them said they never could envision Germany as being poor. Germany, the Treaty of Versailles absolutely crushed Germany. And it was in a very vulnerable spot i mean it, it for a leader like hitler he brought benefits to germany you know he didn't come out with a placard saying i'm going to kill six million jews he didn't you know he he brought benefits to germany then then constructed a scapegoat so i mean this it, it becomes these leaders that are that are notorious and evil have also done things that endear sure. people to them. i mean that's point. Right. Yeah, and, and that happens during times when people are in need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, and I think that also is extremely important because, you know, we always want to believe we'd be on the right side of, of history. Of, of history. We, you know, yeah. we, you know, we would never be slave owners. We would never have collaborated with the Nazis. We would never, you know, we wouldn't have done that. Of course we wouldn't. Well, you know, I mean, depends on where you were at the time and what you knew and what you didn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, and that gets back, I think, to what you're talking about, the biases and how it's, so, it's very important to bring in other aspects because people, you know, it's, it's um, we always want to feel like we would have done the right thing. But mm -hmm. uh, um, it, it's very interesting because um, I had I got a chance to speak with the grandson of the, as I say, the real no longer alive Maria von Trapp of Trapp family, Sound of Music fame. And their actual story is... Um, well, I mean, I love the movie myself, but their actual story is really quite, quite something. Oh, quite different. But, um, but the grandson said that he always wanted to talk to the people who stayed behind because he realized that his grandparents, they, they actually were not wealthy by the time they left. They had become somewhat bankrupt, but they still had the name and they were known. They performed throughout Europe and they had Italian passports. So they didn't hike over the mountains in Switzerland. When they got on the train and went, looked like they were going hiking in Italy, which they often did, and they just didn't come back. And they, but they had the means to do that. And they had traveled around enough and they had heard enough about Hitler that they, you know, there were people who probably heard things but didn't know what to do. I mean, they couldn't leave and they didn't know what to do, you know, and um, it doesn't excuse anything, but you know, we all want to feel like, yeah, the <laughs> sea says like Canada, you know, we all want to feel like we would have done the right thing and we hope we would, but you never know, gotcha. depending on where you are, Understood. you know, which I think is, is just very, um, is very important. By the way, one, and, and to sort of underscore this, there was a, and this was written into the film, but in a different way, there's an interview with the actual Maria and she writes, she talks about how during the time, because they were in Ger they were in Austria for about 10 years. Uh, I mean, they didn't leave when they were children, you know, in the real, real scene. But <clears throat> she said night after night, none of the family liked Hitler. I mean, they, they said he was, he was vulgar, he was crude, he was just, you know, they just couldn't stand him. And so night after night, they talked about this at the dinner table. This went on and on and on and on. And one night the butler approached the captain and said, sir, I need to speak with you privately. They went into the next room. He turned his lapel over. There was a swastika. He said, I feel it is my duty to inform you 
that I am a member of the party, but he never turned them in. They know he never turned them in because Hitler would have had a crosshair on them. He was, I mean, they were famous enough, but, you know, which made you, you might have advantage in some ways, but vulnerable in others. And that's another aspect of it. I mean, this man was a Nazi, a committed Nazi, but why he, I mean, he, he risked his life by not turning them in. Understood. You know, Understood. that does that doesn't make him good, you know, or right. bad or, you know, but I, all of these shades of compliance and non-compliance and the deeper you get into hearing people's stories, their narratives, it is a very complex, you know, complex thing. More yeah, than we would like to think. have to be taught. So this way Absolutely. children will Absolutely. understand Absolutely. the oppression that the world That's perpetrated right. throughout history. That's and, right. Uh, our goal, at least one of our goals, is to make children understand that these things can never be repeated. You cannot right. allow for these atrocities to ever take place again. That's right. All right. So let me open up the forum to a few more folks. Herb, would you like to share? Yes. The uh, <clears throat> I, I, I like the uh, the poem and the subject of child labor. That yes. And it, uh, it reminded me of what I've learned about uh, uh, a so-called hero of individualism, uh, John Locke. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, now John Locke said that children ought to start working at age three to, to get them used to the harsh realities of work and, and, and accept it. Uh, he, he also talked about them, he, he and many others had this theory of uh, the uh, tabula rasa, that there, there was nothing there and you could make of it whatever you wanted, and that's what he was doing. And I would contrast him uh, as an Enlightenment figure with another Enlightenment figure, uh, uh, Leibniz. And Leibniz believed that the individual had infinite depth that the closer you looked at in on his life and his autobiography as if, if you were taking a zoom you know, into the details, the fine details, that you would see so much, it is endless. And so in other words, he had respect for what the individual was and Locke did not. Gotcha. Yeah. Well said. Well, heard, what did you think of the program? Did I do a good job? Yes. It, I'm sorry. Uh, it, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I heard you were saying. Did I yeah, I, no, it, it, you, you brought it to life uh, that, 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 that she was outraged and, and that this whole society should be outraged. The children who were the, you know, the, the least able to defend themselves were being the most taken advantage of for what they could you know, cheaply be gotten for. So it was a form of slavery. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Okay. So should I um, uh, take so that Bob. as a compliment? Bob. Should I take that as a compliment? I'm sorry, I can't hear her. Yeah, it, it's a compliment of, of the, 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 that all these themes uh, were, were woven into that. Very good. Yeah, and, and, and so I felt, yeah, uh, just, just as a, like a summation, that I felt like a, you were giving us a tour of history in a poetic way. In other words, you were going from this island to that island to that island, but they were all connected. And, and people, it's like a torch being passed and all the way to Amanda Gorman. And I, uh, I for one, uh, just thoroughly enjoyed that trip. Thank you, greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Herb. Uh, that means a lot. I mean, I really appreciate your opinions. Anybody else want to share something from? Uh, hold on, I think James wants to interrupt me because we're over our time. Correct? I'm not. I'm not. No, I'm not interrupting at you all. I'm the moderator, so it makes it a lot easier for me to ask the questions for other people. So yes, you don't you're have absolutely to... right. I'm taking over all the roles right now. Right. I moderator. understand that you don't have audience to... member. You don't have to do. Right. You don't. You don't have to do that. Um, right. And so... I'm also working the concession stand. Sure, sure. The one thing that I would like to say, and, and we can open it up for discussion in, in, sure. in, in one second, but I'm a, I'm a little I'm a little tired of the social justice and the Elizabeth Barrett Browning talks. <laughs> I think this is our fourth one. This this, you know, is that right? Is that and, right? But know, not like mine. Not, not like mine. No, no, you, you did really good. You did really good. Thanks. I just, I, you know, and, and I and I already defended earlier in this in this speech um, and, I, and I'll do it again. But I just wanted to say that, you know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning was one of the first prominent individual abolitionists and feminists mm -hmm. of our time. And as one of the top selling poets in the world, she was the first one Absolutely. to really bring light onto these subjects, to bring 
that, 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 that beautiful spotlight onto the plight of the slaves. Thus the refrain in the, run, uh, the runaway slave at, at Pilgrim Point is, is to write. So she was inviting us to write. She was wanting exactly. other people to write about these causes, to write about this and that. And that was in a period of time when people actually still read. She right. was happened to be the number one read poet in the world at the time. Absolutely, wanted her to be poet laureate. And her and her putting her her attention to this cause is something that I don't think that should be revisited or re, you know reevaluated or, or or criticized because without her standing up, you know there would have been it gave courage. Without her courage, it gave courage to other people to stand up, and the ball started ro- uh, moving, and we actually ended slavery. And so, you know, slavery had existed the entire human history. This is not something that is within the last 200, 300 years, but because people's uh, ability to understand history is so limited to like yesterday's news, their their opinion of slavery is, is relegated to uh, their own um, media experience of it at this point. So, I, I, so when you were saying that there's shades of colors, I was, or, or when Nancy was saying that there's shades of the, uh, complicity, it's not that, it's shades of humanity. And humanity, so what really makes me upset is when people say, well, that man was a monster or Adolf Hitler was a monster. No, they were men. They were humans. See, so when, when, you, when you start to take the human element out, out of it, that's when you, 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 you have a failure to realize where this really happens and how this does happen. And mm-hmm. when you said that this can never happen again, I disagree. I think that this will happen continuously and this earth will continue for a long time. So, you know, we learn, we learn from our past and we can make our own ability to ch- treat our own, uh, our, our lives uh, the way that we do and to treat other people um, with respect and dignity. And I think that's really what we're lacking right now is a sense of dignity. Um, so that's, that's my opinion on the talk. I, I'm really not a big social justice guy. I, I'm for everybody. <laughs> I'm go team, team everybody, you know, so uh, I, thought like- was, I thought it was really good. What do you say? Herb? I'd like to ask. Tom? I'd like to ask Bob McNeil a question. Yep. I don't know uh, the answer. I'll save you some time right now. <laughs> um, do you do you have any insight into uh, the uh, bit of an obsession that Elizabeth Barrett Browning had that she was part black? You know. Uh, um, and which she said in a letter to uh, Robert when he was quoting right. her and in other letters and diary entries, she occasionally mentioned it. And do you think that that, I mean, it seems obvious, but who knows? Do you think that that was something that really motivated her in her justice, justice right. work? Or is that just incident, incidental or? Uh... It's a very good question. Okay, I'm not a geneticist. I don't know about the deoxy right. No, right. We don't, don't know really know. Of, yeah, we don't or, really don't know. know how to that word. We know that she <laughs> believed. We know that she believed that. Right. Whether well, it's well, true we or know, not, well, we know is we, another question. We know that her father believed that. That's the reason why he he forbade all of his children from having sexual relationships. So he may have planted that in her. He was the one that planted that in their heads because he was the one who for, forbade them from even dating. And that's why it was such a scandal in their own household that Robert had to, you know, basically steal her away in the middle of the night. So, yeah, there's definitely an issue there that they were concerned that they, you know, had been a part of the, you know, that had some sort of black, you know, heritage. I think James answered that uh, adequately, but, you know, um, does it really matter at the end of the day? At that time, socially, it made a big difference. No, undoubtedly, yeah. but it doesn't affect the importance of the poetry that she created one way or the other. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but you know, there's also in the in the field, if you will, of identity politics. <laughs> um, this is getting good. If, if she this is, is part, <laughs> if she indeed is part black, couldn't she be an important figure in a way for African American for sure. African Americans? Uh, the Gorman over time, a uh, a cultural a, a cultural figure for the for them. Uh, I'm going to have to say you're going to uh, need to have this conversation with a better mind than mine. I'm going to have to concede okay. that. All right. Okay, <laughs> all right. I don't blame you. I don't again, blame you. If, yeah, I don't blame you. The best I can if, say is deoxyribonucleic acid really doesn't play a part in the greatness of her poetry. 
as far as I'm concerned. Her, and I don't think was, I don't think it plays a part in anybody's poetry. Right. Well, not in her case, really. I mean, uh, in the sense that she was moved to write about the plight of others, uh, regardless of what her racial background happened to be. I think that's what we really need to bear in mind. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else would like I, to uh, weigh in on this yeah. one? I just wanted to say, not specifically on this one, although um, I agree with you, uh, uh, Bob, that in Thank this you. case, you know, particularly because her life was not that, also, her life was not that of a slave, right? Her mm -hmm. life was not. So, so exactly. th there was, I mean, to. I don't know. I don't know. She was well, enslaved well, in her woman. house for 40 okay, years. As a woman, yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, it's okay, not quite the same as. as Field workers. Well, well, but it, it could have it could have it, it could have given her some additional sense of empathy, you know. But mm. um, but no, I was going to um, to say getting back to this business of history and what what James was saying that you're right. The same thing goes with you know. Hit, okay, Hitler was a man. Okay, he did evil things. Um, he did. So I, we, we don't want to say you know that he did some good things, but as I said, he brought benefits to war destroyed Germany and German people needed benefits and he he did that i mean he that's and so when people say how did he get to that degree of power that people you know were, were taken in by him but i was going to say also um it's the other side is true too uh the people that conventionally have been upheld as heroes are they were people and so that's why you know we have Thomas Jefferson, who has been reappraised. Um, we have, but he wrote the Declaration of Independence, and we say, what a hypocrite! But we also know this man was a visionary. He thought in the abstract, and when you learn other things about him, it's not exactly surprising that he would detach himself from his own reality to write the Declaration of Independence. So you know, do you throw out the Declaration of Independence because of who wrote it? Uh, the declaration now there's you know people will say that unfettered liberty becomes an inimical to equality and that's no doubt true um but again it was his vision i mean you know so so that's one thing um woodrow wilson with his 14 points and oh my gosh i mean he was about as sexist from everything i've read sexist racist everything um but he was he wrote 14 points so do we discard the 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 good works that come from these people um you know just like no. do we we have to see them as humans um we have to see them as humans who made some good contributions but you know we're short-sighted in many other ways okay. i would say so, the answer is clear i'd say the clear the answer is clearly no up until a certain point you know most people in america were very anti um uh drug usage especially with needles now it's become very popular to take needle drugs but like, if I was to say I'm anti-heroin, would, I have, to, would I have to throw out my vinyl collection? Right. You know, if I, if I said I was anti-alcoholism, would I have to throw out my book collection? I mean, I think that the work should stand on its own because the man is yeah. the person that produced it. And that guy's mm -hmm. gone, way gone. So why do we have to deal with, why do we have to cancel somebody that's already dead? I'm glad you used that word. Okay. The reason why council culture is so prevalent today is because people are fed up with seeing offensive images. Now, um, let's get something straight. Let me preface my statement by saying I harbor no prejudice against any specific group, okay? Um, the same way Jews respond to seeing a schwarzstika is the same way Blacks respond to seeing a Confederate flag. Hmm. It's offensive. And it is important that every generation says to the last one, oh, Lazarus, why aren't you dead? Because we have to get rid of the past. We have to move on. If the past happens to be ugly, we have to destroy it. That then is how do, we, then how do we not repeat every it? Every generation. We do not venerate tyrants. Yes, they were human beings, but they were tyrannical human beings. Mm -hmm. They were despotical human beings. They were opprobrious human beings. You always have to add those other adjectives when talking about human beings that are willing to enslave, to oppress, to destroy mm -hmm. other human beings. We do not venerate these people in a civilized society, okay? We I'm have saying to put wait, that I'm, I'm saying wait, I'm oh, wait, saying, wait, 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 hold on, James, James. You, you said eliminate the past, you said eliminate the past. I'm talking about statues, flags, I'm not. things of that nature. I'm talking about those things. I'm and saying those things, those things have to be removed from public view because they are a source of offense. Now, hold on. 
in keeping with that same subject. We cannot destroy literature as a result of offense. Well, why not? You're some, already on the slope. You're not allowing me to finish it. Shakespeare wrote some very offensive things about women, wrote some very offensive things about Blacks. But I am not going to burn Shakespeare's work as a result mm-hmm. of that because he wrote great things. Hemingway was a misogynist, an anti-Semite, a bully, mm-hmm. a horrible person. But we still will read Hemingway. That is our choice. However, a statue in a park removes the choice from an individual circumambulating. The choice has been taken away. If I see a Confederate flag in a public building, my choice has been taken away because I find that offensive. I take umbrage to such an image. Such an image should burn. Robert E. Lee should burn an effigy. All the Confederates should burn an effigy. Do you there say were that as a to... individuals, appropriate individuals, the worst individuals you could possibly make? I can carve a better human being out of a pile of garbage. And I do not need to see those images in a public place. However, if I want to read the work of a Southern writer who supported the Confederates, that is my prerogative to walk into a library to do so. That's a choice. But I do not need to see the image of a Confederate in a public place because I find that offensive. Do you see the difference in cancel culture now? No, I'm what saying that this is a poetry, wait, 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 is a on, poetry on, lecture, I don't want literature to and history. Moderator. No one brought that up. I'm sorry, James. I said this was a a lecture on poetry and literature and history. And so no one brought this whole, all this other stuff up. So I just wanted to say that's your personal opinions and and, and you're entitled to them. But I'm just trying to say that a good example, uh, what's his face? You don't see a, you don't see a statue of him, but Norman Mailer, right? He was a horrible guy. Right, but at one point he was the the Hemingway of of, of his particular time. Again, and he's you're just missing now my point, James. You have the right to go into a library in a democratic society and get the work of Norman Mailer, and I would suggest that you do so because he was a great writer. But to venerate the figure in a statue, where everybody will see, which will cause offense, is a different story. They're not comparable. Okay, I just didn't, no one brought up statue but you. That's all I'm saying. But, I, I mean, know. obviously I'm talking about that because that's a part of cancel culture. That's why statues are being removed. That's why Theodore Roosevelt was removed as a result of cancel culture. People did not want to see him next to an indigenous person and an African on a horse. That was a beautiful a, statue. That's a great white leader. Nobody wants to see that in the 21st century, James. Nobody yes, wants to see that. Work. But students have the right from. to go into libraries to get the work of Theodore Roosevelt, to get his speeches, to get anything about him. That is your choice. But I don't want to see a statue about him. Well, again, what about, you burn an effigy. Okay. No, what, about putting those, what about putting those statues in a gallery in a museum? Then you have the choice not to go yeah. into that gallery. And that's what they did. That's what they did in Prague. Yeah. Whenever they removed right. all the Soviet that, statues, yeah. they put them into a Soviet, you know, they had yeah. a whole, they kept the statues. Then you can view Because the, these are works of art. Yeah, the other the thing- The dubious works work, of art, James. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. Can yes. I say something about the work of art business? Yeah, yeah just, just one thing I wanted, just wanted to add on that is that, um, is that, that, for example, now, if you go to the Truman, um, museum and library in Independence, Missouri. One thing I really admire about those curators, they do not withhold aspects of Truman's administration that were not laudable. Um, among them, the caricatures of Japanese because it was World War II exactly. and there was this globalization. Okay, they're out there. They're not out there so people can admire them. They're out there so people can see them. Now you cannot go into that gallery. They don't have a wonderful tribute to it. They just have them there and they speak for themselves. And what I... Um, what I appreciate about the candor of that is that you can see for yourself. They don't. They don't applaud Truman at the same time. They just say this was part of. He did not. He did not stop it. it well, it was. I guess he figured it would have violated the First Amendment. Now we can debate the First Amendment. Um, but the point is, I think, you know. So I mean, I would agree with you about having them on boulevards, avenues, parks. But if they are put into museums then people can choose, as you're saying, choose to read, choose to go into that gallery, say, no, that even going in that gallery is too offensive, or you can go in and you can see them, not to applaud them, but to say, ah, this is a part of history we don't want to repeat. Sequester them. So, so this way, yeah. you don't have to offend everybody um, as right. they make their way my, to my only, my only caveat with right. you, Bob, in your statements was mm-hmm. that you said that- Only one? Because you, you, <laughs> you, you contradicted yourself in the sense that you said, that these things that have happened can never happen again. 
And then you said we must delete or, 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 or you know, get rid of the past. I didn't say that, Jeff. <laughs> So I'm what not I'm a saying is you, you wanted to get rid of you wanted to get rid of the past to erase our the bad evil history that we have. James, James, I'm not what a I'm trying to say is that you can't you can't you can't not know when you cut your link to the past, then you have really no compass to the future. Okay. So what I was saying was that students should learn about history. So we do not repeat history. That was my statement. I cannot predict the future. Had I predicted the future, I would have invested a lot more money in rap. <laughs> but my point is all jokes aside is that um oh, i'm sorry no, it's perfectly right. uh, we yeah, want I, students sorry. to understand the full spectrum of history but at the same time we do not want them to repeat the atrocities of the past does that make sense well that's up to them you know this whole parental it is. It is up to the future generation to decide the history. Like, you know, who are we to be so pretentious to say that you, I can make something out of a piece of garbage that looks better than Theodore Roosevelt's statue? I mean, uh, uh, James, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, I don't want to say anything so much, Jeff. I, I do a human but being my, out of a piece yeah. of garbage than Theodore Roosevelt. Okay. That I can yeah. attest. That okay. I can say okay. unequivocally. My, I can, can I just say this? Can I just say this? Piece of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say this real quickly? Yes, My battery please. is going fast. And okay, so I, if I sign off, I don't want anybody to think that I'm upset by this conversation and I'm no, leaving please. or something. I'm not walking out. My battery may die and I may have to leave you. I've said more than enough, more than my share probably. But I just want to say this because if my battery goes, I don't want anybody to think that I am, I mean, nothing has offended me so that I've signed off. It's strictly a, a dead battery. And this has been wonderful. I just want to say that. Excuse me Thank for you. interrupting. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Yeah. And discourse is always appreciated. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's end on this. Oh, I sincerely hope you enjoyed yes. the program, folks. By a show of thumbs, I sincerely hope that you enjoyed the program, please. All right, That's once, it. Again, once again, Bob, once again, Bob, we'd like to thank Bob McNeil for his presentation today. Uh, let's give a warm round of applause for Bob. Thank you for so much for your excellent presentation on Elizabeth Barrett Browning, her poems, verses, <laughs> verses, verses. <laughs> Versus, and uh, ultimately, Bob, thank you so much for having us out. Is there any more questions that we have uh, for the speaker before he gets out of uh, gets out of here? To be continued. Okay. I'm sorry. That discussion. <laughs> I said to be form. continued. Well, I sincerely hope that you will have me yet again. I truly enjoy doing this. James knows this. James and I, we uh, butt heads on various uh, issues, but nonetheless, we have a. Uh, common love of art and its importance. Am I right about that, James? Yeah, it's like trading places. I live in Harlem, you live in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> so in this analogy, am I uh, Bill Murray or am I Eddie Murphy? Which one am I in this? Very funny. <laughs> That's a good Eddie Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, That's seriously, Bob, you know, and, and you know what you really do, you really are really effective with the kids. And hopefully in the near future, we can get it to a place where we can bring the high school kids in. You'll feel comfortable yes. and we can yes. bring back that environment because I know that they really appreciate you. And we appreciate your talk. And once again, let's give a round of applause for Bob McNeil, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, folks. God bless you all. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Uh, good night. Good night. seeing all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Same here. And thank you, Edna, for your poems. They were beautiful as yes, well. Yes, please, a round of applause to Edna. Very good point. Thank you, James. Okay, let's not forget. Okay, good night, all. Uh, all right, have a drink, boss. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> okay. I've won for me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right, James, can I uh, pull you aside to uh, Facebook for two seconds? Two seconds. I'll talk to you. I'm not on that level. I'll talk to you in a little bit, okay? All right, whenever you're ready. All right, boss. Have a good night. Okay, cool. You do. Yep. An evening. Quite an evening. Spicy. Yeah, spicy. Bob. I didn't know it would go in that. Bob, are you taking <laughs> off as well? Robert. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to a poetry reading in a few minutes. Oh, well, nice. Very nice. I got a bail box as a poetry reading tonight. Oh, very cool. Wednesday night. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, get on over there and read some poetry, boss. Okay, good show, James. Good show. Good All seeing right. you. Ciao. 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 Bye, Herb. Bye, Herb. Bye, Herb. Bye, Herb. Bye, Herb.
Bye bye, Tom. Bye bye, Bob. <laughs> bye bye, James. You guys have a great night. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> we all got to the end. <laughs> yeah, I didn't expect it to go that way, but you know, it is what it is. Um, it uh, well, thank <laughs> God. Next next month we don't have a social justice. Oh, they're in the same room. These weirdos. So. <laughs> Yeah, so thank God we don't have a uh, a social justice Bye. thing for next month. Uh, yeah. It's more about death and browning. So. Oh, yeah, there's something more peaceful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Laura was a little tired of all the social justice stuff too, you know, and it is what it is. But you know, I think it was, you know, it, I mean, I think it was. Well, a well it, it, it was a, it was a kind of a dance between social justice and some other themes that are just as engaging. And, yeah. and that, that cross paths with, and, yeah. and that, that's what I enjoyed. Uh, like I say, it's a slave labor and, and great figures like uh, Leibniz and lousy figures like John Locke that don't deserve their reputations. Yeah. Well, it's so funny because like John Locke was what I cut my teeth on, you know, like- um, Everybody. The treat yeah. yeah. The treatise of uh, government or whatever. Uh, yeah. First treatise of government. And, you know, there was, you know, Thomas Hobbes and John Stuart Mill and, John Jacques Rousseau, and you know, there was a lot of those um, uh, social contract philosophers, but they were the ones that really were, I guess, responsible for a lot of the what we what we would consider uh, representative. Uh, I mean, you know, dem democratic uh, societies now. You well, know, well, they were. Well, they, they, I think they took ideas that came from elsewhere that were truly democratic, and they distorted them for their yeah. own purposes to 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 well, they all uh, had a slant, gain yeah. power. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, Locke, uh, you know, he's known for, for, for tolerance, but in, in his writings, he says very clearly, he says, I will give no tolerance to an atheist. You yep. know, and the state should ban it. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. And, uh, you know, and what's what's funny is because of that statement, we literally got the exact opposite, you know, within uh, 200 years where you know, religion was banned and atheism was, you know, the religion. So, I mean, it's funny how these things, it's always like the trickle down effect of this stuff that really is kind of interesting, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, it's a kaleidoscope. History keeps, you know, twisting the pieces yeah. and, and, and people try to make sense of where they came from and then where do they want to go? But I'm, as far as like destroying any sort of monuments or stuff, I'm totally against that because I love yeah. that stuff, you know? I travel to go see old statues, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, well, there, yeah, there's, 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 there's something to it. They're, they're yeah, really absolutely. Well, it's a link to the, it's a link to the past and, you know, and the only reason why we have Gebekli Tepe, and that's the oldest temple, the oldest thing that we really have right now. I'm sure we have older that we can find, but it was because they buried it because they knew that, that the people would destroy it. So they just buried oh. the whole thing. And so literally wow. 14, 1300 years later, 13,000 years later, you know, a goat herder with a staff plugs a hole into the into the, the pig belly, you know, hill. And now we have this massive temple from, you know, the oldest temple, the oldest structure we have, you know. Where, 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 where is this? In what country? It's uh, on the southern border of Turkey, right at, uh, like, it's in Shanli Urfa, like about 15 minutes north of um, Syria. Uh -huh. um, and it's so funny because Shanli Urfa is a really big city, you know, it's got like at least a million people. But like, you try looking at it in Google Maps and you won't be able to see much. Uh, um, but yeah, you go, I, w I was down there last year and it is just, I mean, when you get into that's the, pretty much the top hat of Mesopotamia. And when yeah. you get there, you feel that energy in the air, you know, that there's something, you know, magical going on about that, that land, you know, if the first big city that really worked was Uruk, which was, yep, uh, sure. yeah, yeah. Which, uh, had much more going for it than Ur. Or, or well, was a you know like a prototype, but, sure, but the, sure. they added certain things that, that really uh, convinced a lot of um, of people who who well, were. Urk was, on, Urk was on the Urk was on the water, so that was the first thing, right? And yeah. Ur was the the one that they built into the yeah into the capital. Yeah, the Uruk wel welcomed all these uh, hunter gatherers who were tired of beating around in the forest and leading a very hard life, and said, "Come, come live here." And practically anything you want will be obtainable, yeah. including women, you know, and yeah. uh, sure. Uh, and, but they built a whole culture where people served each other, basically. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's funny because like speaking more towards that where Quebec Tepe is, is Shanley Urfa and, and even right there on the border of Syria is Haran. Have you ever heard of Haran? 
That's like the no. birthplace of science. That's the that's where they ah. trans that's where they translated all the all the uh, you know the Arabia and the Middle Eastern works into the you know Western works. Um, uh -huh. That's where oh. that's where that's where the tower from tarot comes from. There was supposed to be a great tower. That was where they just uh, started with astronomy. Uh -huh. Iran. So this is a, it. Sounds like the Renaissance or the late Middle well, Ages. Abraham, Abraham, or Ibrahim, or whoever, oh. whatever that he was born there. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. you know, oh, yeah. So yeah. it's got a lot of historical significance, but uh -huh. no one even knows where you know. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying. Unless you go there, you yeah. wouldn't even know it's there. I mean, even on oh. Google Maps, it's like just it's like a I don't know. It's like a <laughs> top secret military <laughs> installation, and it's just like a bunch of goat herders with like beehive houses. You know, it's funny funny to me cool. <laughs> yeah but if you haven't if you haven't looked into gebekli tepe or that area i mean I, I if you want to do some research it's really fascinating i was very lucky to be there you know and uh, see it for myself but uh hmm. yeah it's something else and it, and, and it, it's so bizarre because the shanley Irfa archaeological museum which is massive massive museum and that's where you get a lot of that cuneiform from ur and uruk and and you know all that cuneiform i was just reading it you know they have it translated mm -hmm. all that old cuneiform is uh, magic spells, spells oh. against uh, spells against demons, spells against uh, you know people coming into your house, spells against bad dreams, uh, like uh, ingredients to, to for stomach ailments, ingredients. So it was all very specific to what their interests were, and it was just all about everyday magic. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, magic and apothecary. Yeah, magic and apothecary. It was really kind of interesting to see. <laughs> But yeah, it, I, I, you know, if you ever get the chance, uh, Shanley Urfa, I mean, it's so cheap to go over there right now. I'd love, I'm, I'm going to go back, but I don't know exactly when yet. I'm in Colorado at the moment, so um, oh. I'll be back uh, in the city uh, Sunday, uh, I think. So yeah, I've been here for about a month. It's been tough. Um, my mom passed and my dad. Oh. Passed, so yeah, so it is what it is. I don't want to say, but I, I'm glad to see your face. How's everything over there? For, for me it's good yeah. um the yeah city, everything anything going on there um i i don't i'm, I'm not too plugged into that it's i'm more in with local things in my neighborhood and, and well, my the neighborhood? Well, congregation oh, well, the neighborhood it's good we're getting another uh, you know uh, peruvian uh um a restaurant um th this one's a little more modern kind more of per, uh, more peruvian it's called, called, called lime, and, lime and salt it's more of a, a you know mod restaurant whereas the other one was very traditional yeah. but uh the it was i don't know if it was losing customers or they just got tired of running it and so they sold it to some other people oh. and they're more jazzy and and so we're going to try it out next month more fusion but, uh, more like new things like yeah yeah like uh well, i can't I'm really not... honestly say what what peruvian cuisine is all about you know chicken more chicken oh, okay all right okay. <laughs> and, and, and and plantains okay. and, right. and beans beans fits in there too beans and yeah. rice yeah. All right. well, that's uh, but uh they, they, we, i went out for the first time in two months to a indoor restaurant uh i mean the percentages this this is what the news isn't is isn't that crazy that you had to say something like that <laughs> well, <laughs> it, 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 per, per, percentages were 25% incidents uh, two months ago, and now they're 3% in Queens. Qu Queens is a little lower than Long Island, and, and uh, Manhattan's probably a little lower. When you say incidents, yeah. does that mean Peruvian restaurants? Uh, it, it, yeah, <laughs> the indexes for each one of them because they're followed so closely. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I hope everything's i thought i thought there were other people you know listening to us but i see that that we're the two Just people in you. Yeah. yeah good good yeah uh, but you know there are people watching oh <laughs> <laughs> not too many. well there i hope they more. <laughs> do like you know monetize like, this. my, my no. priorities are all i'm i'm like I've, I've gone through some like major life-changing events so um you know, I, I, I'm uh, I'm looking to take advantage of uh, of what's going, you know, of the now more so than I was before. Uh, That's so good. Yeah, yeah, it is good. It is good. And you know, uh, is there any particular thing that uh, you uh, want to? Well, I, you know, I, I really still haven't even had a chance to grieve properly, but no. um, you know, I, I feel like I've I, I've been able to reevaluate like. Mm, you know, especially because I'm not in New York. See, that's the whole thing about like New York City is like 
if you do get a chance to go somewhere outside for at least a month or so, you know, you really can like look at what's going on there and be able to like have an objective opinion of what you're doing, whether it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, I felt that when I I was in Minneapolis for a month in August. Yeah, and that's how I felt. Yeah. So it's a good it's a good opportunity to to when I get back to be able to really kind of like make some changes that that have needed to be made. And I just was kind of in a rut uh before uh, um so yeah no i don't know but i mean you know i really think that some of these conversations that we've had and i and i've recorded some of them over the years or whatever but i think it would be really you know and i i know it's a, a oversaturated market with pretty much every media thing right now but you know when it comes to particular like i don't know if it's a quote, quote podcast or something but you know we could we could have discussions that might be valuable to people uh, down the line or so I, I think that's a great thing about the Browning site is that you know at least we're archiving all this oh that's that's that, that's a tremendous uh, the is, is the um, uh, the talk that was given just pr- prior to this one recorded and on the website it's on the website absolutely oh because because I you know I came in you know after most of the formal talk was was given so I, yeah. I, I won to see it so yeah I, I yeah absolutely able. no it's there and you know uh, and i've and we've been very fortunate to even even for the last five six years to you know not record everyone but to have gotten a lot of stuff on there i know there's uh, a lot there i remember when you took you know, me through the, yeah the, yeah the so you know, I, I mean ultimately laura is getting some new talent we got a couple of new people i mean we're we're going to create you know we're going to continue we're, the brand society is going to be fine as far as continuing to create content, this actually makes it a lot easier and more cost effective. This 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 sort of manner, uh, and yeah. it also makes it more available. To be honest, um, well, much more available. So e- even though we only had what seven to nine partic- nine participants for this meeting, which is I think the lowest we've had, you know there you know I mean that's still something. And this is being streamed well, a lot, a lot live on it. Facebook it was, right now. So it was a, it was a very special meeting, and 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 there were different personalities that came right. out that that got. To be, you know, heard and you could react to them. You could say whatever you wanted. And Bob McNeil dressing up in a dress and doing an English accent. That was. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> let what? me tell you about. <laughs> let me tell you about something that I'm doing, and I'm not dressing up in a dress to do it, but sure, it, I feel just as exposed. So. <laughs> <But> yeah. <laughs> There's, at my church, I have uh, spent three months designing a. Uh, monthly talk series done completely online and and the host for the meeting is the men's group and the men's group in our church is the sort of laid back off in the corner don't bother us kind of you know we we just want to sit and enjoy our conversation and it used to be our beer or coffee you know whatever Uh, yeah uh, yeah, we, we had beer at every meeting then they then they outlawed it they didn't outlaw in the church they they limited it to to um Certain kinds of uh, uh, double hoppy IPAs. <laughs> you, you know, they're only beginning to get that in. They were they had all all this you know Central European beer, you know, and and sure, and, sure. and Irish and um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, it, it wasn't bad. Some of those nice. Um, so uh, so the men's group got a reputation in, in terms of the rest of the congregation. Is, uh, they're they're sort of um, off the map. And and aren't really contributing anything of great worth. Yeah. And meanwhile, uh, the women's group, you know, had a whole superstructure like a battleship with, with all kinds of you know, many different events every week, and and uh, you know a lot of thought going into it, and a tremendous just formal structure uh, written into the bylaws. You know, they elected their own officers and stuff like that. Yeah. So so it was a big contrast and. And so the last couple of years, the men's group has been trying to find its identity and find a leader. They, they, they found a couple of people who uh, were, were um, good leaders in certain ways that began to take them out of that and began to listen to the members, you know, for their new ideas instead of just saying, well, we've never done that. Let's not bother. You know? yeah. So these people said, let's bother. If you're willing to bother, I'll stand behind you. That's what, you know, sure. Ch- Chairman said. And so in three months, I put together with the help of uh, ultimately 20 different people that I drew on and for, for both ideas and, and for volunteering, uh, I put together a technology talk series. Oh, that sounds nice. 
So the idea would be there'd be a presenter or somebody to be interviewed alternatively. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and then when that person was finished, there'd be a Q and A, and then there would be a, a discussion, like, you know, a conversation, you know, between the people present. It, which, which, which for us, you know, it was sort of very natural, very homey, because that's the nature of men's group. It's not like we were doing something artificial. We're doing something we're good at. Sure. Um, it's the subject that that you, you'd be say, oh, well, that, that isn't doesn't quite fit you. Well, I said to myself, let me dig under the surface for each of the 12 members that we had. Yeah as opposed to the, the 40 members of the women's group, you know, and, and, and find out what technology was in their background, because I knew a few of them it was, and it turned out that there were six of them okay. that had technology in their background, and I decided to make it not, don't tell me about the subject, tell me about what you did with the subject, your experience, talk from your experience. So, so, oh, you, you bought an a electric car, in fact, you bought two of them at different times, and you want to compare them and tell us what you learned. Yep. So we got that. Then we have a minister. We have three ministers. They're they're all women now. Um, Is that interesting? It, yeah, it, it used to be all men, you know. And, and the, yeah, that's what I except, except for the religious education person was was a woman, and, and then it, it's drifted to this. And it's it, we got a woman called the developmental minister who, who's with us for, for four years to help us make you know a like a five year plan for the future. You know, be intentional about change. And uh, and she and I hit it off very nicely. Her her, her name is Jay, first name. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jay turns out as, when I talked to her about some things I was interested in that had to do with science and technology, she lit up. And yeah. she started asking me questions about it. And let's have a little conversation about this. And, I said, and it turns out that this is a big interest on her part. So I have her as the second program. The, the first one's on electric cars. Second one is her being interviewed by us about how did you get that way yeah yeah well, so sounds pretty cool. humanizing the minister yeah yeah, yeah, and, yeah absolutely well yeah. it makes it it makes them more accessible as well you know exactly exactly so i'm gonna do the last one but the next to the last one i'll just mention is 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 on art art technology from the 1960s a guy named billy kluver who put Bell Labs uh, technicians together with artists that wanted to do really cool projects of a performing arts nature yeah. and use electronics to, to enhance it. Uh, so he was there at the, uh, it, it was an armory show. They sat at the bleachers and watched like a tennis game where the tennis rackets were, were wired for sound and, and, and there were algorithms that would, you know, give off interesting kinds of uh, sound effects when the ball was hit. Um, okay, so he, so this member of our, our group was actually there mm -hmm. and knew all about what was happening, and he, he's going to, to recall his, his experiences. What did he see what, what, and what attached uh, to, to that experience that he is important for now? Makes it unique, yeah. Yeah, so I'm really talking. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and the last one's going to be me talking about longevity research and prospects. That sounds interesting. I know a lot about it from having gone to a all-day uh, conference on it, you know, and that the New York Academy of Sciences gave, and so um, I, I'm really turned on by it. So I will take you know my experience of learning, mm -hmm. and and talk about that. So that's we have five programs for this year because I didn't want to start us out early. I wanted to have all the the time that we could uh, have to for pr preparation. So we start, we start in two weeks on, uh, you know, toward the end of February. And, um, but I have next year, two thirds planned. And I've got a, a national figure from a Unitarian movement already confirmed to speak well, that's great. Uh, in March of that year. Yeah. That is great news. Yeah. So you should be so, sending me links to this. I know, I mean, what do I have to be a Unitarian to get, you know, like, is it a private entrance group, like a uh, VIP? <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially your talk. It's um, well, we're 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 just you know keeping a low profile. And, I'm a and men. I'm a I'm a men. I'm I can belong into a men's group. <laughs> we we had we had a gay man once who who was in the closet, and when our church uh, came 
the church came out and said, we are, you know, a welcoming congregation to, to any and all people, you know, including gays. Yeah. So he, he came out to the men's group. Oh, wow. And he thought we were going to like, you know, want nothing to do with him. And he was so surprised. Said, hey, who cares? It's, it's fine. You know, and, and this guy was the, an Irish poet. Hmm. I mean, a real professional, very accomplished and witty uh, poet who even when, when we would have public uh, ceremonies and stuff, he would be called on to write a poem for the occasion. Well, that's cool. Yeah, that's great. And so uh, glad, I'm glad that it worked out that way. And now I'm sure there's like a Unitarian gay singles, you know, dating platform available as well. <laughs> we, we, we have far more than that. We have got, you know, non-binary and, and transgender and everything. Oh, wow. So you would, yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah universe uh, uh, of that and a number of them have become leaders leaders in the congregation yeah i mean like one of them it was a well that's like the fun that, that's the fundamental pr premise of unitarianism isn't it is inclusion yes so you know I mean, yeah, yeah. it sense. just takes people a while to get around uh, doing yeah. it now i mean uh, to, to just to hark back a little bit to uh, the, the the tone of things that you know that uh, our speaker uh, was sort of talking about okay back in 1960 there were no black ministers mm -hmm. in our congregate in 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 the movement mm -hmm. and somebody went to the theology school and graduated and he's he went in to talk with the president of the whole you know national association and said you know what are what are my chances of getting a, pu a pulpit, a you know, congregation that would accept me? Sure. And the, the president said to him, to tell you the truth, I, I don't think you're going to be able to do it. Yeah. And, and, and the guy, and he was saying it to him so that he, he wouldn't, you know, spend a lot of time and then have nothing to show he would, for Yeah, him. he would hedge his expectations, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you fast forward 20, 25 years, everything turns upside down. Mm -hmm. So so things. So now it's hard know. for a white man to get a pulpit in the Unitarian Church. <laughs> <laughs> well, between the Lat Lat Latinos and, yeah, and the. Sure. Uh, um, we, we have everything now. The, the majority of, uh, of people, I think, at this point are female. The yeah. minister. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, no, the first, the first uh, female, excuse me, yeah, the first female minister in the Unitarian Universalist world was back in the time of the Civil War when those two groups were, were still separate and she yeah. was a Universalist. And um, I, her last name was Brown, I forget her, her first name, and she was a doctor, you know, a physician. And, well, that uh, was hard enough. Olympia, I mean, yeah. Olympia, excuse me, Olympia Brown was, yeah. was her full name. Yeah. And she was, a, a you know, a, a social justice person. Yeah. But she was more than that. She, you know, she was she was a person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we lose a lot of that. And that's really, you know, that's the only that, that's really the only uh not necessarily problems, but caveats that I had with any of these kind of conversations is that we're all just humans, you know. You cut us, we bleed. Well, you know the 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 uh, the thing that you were saying about the you know like Hitler and so forth. I wasn't saying anything about Hitler or statues. That was the other people. I didn't say anything. Oh, about you didn't bring it up. No, but but when you said these were these, these were men. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay. These same approach taken by universalists to talk about all people being human yeah correct and, and 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 pulling out the theological implications of this that uh and so in the 19th century uh which is a little different from the 20th century when they they weren't so tr uh, tr traditional thinking about this spiritual things um in the 19th century they said all people are going to heaven. There is a place called heaven. And by the way, there's no place called hell. In the Bible, it doesn't say that there's hell. No, it doesn't. No. It's, a, it's all kind if of... If God yeah, is a loving God, then why would he punish people? Yeah. They, 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 said it, they, they said it in two ways. They said if yeah. God is a loving God, he would never take a creation of his 
and make it suffer eternally. Correct. Correct. See, and it wouldn't be fair because God is is eternal in his length of living. Yep. And you taking a finite creature who can learn only so much and 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 have sure. only so much, you know, in an evolution in, in the his starting point. Yep. And you're taking unfair advantage of him, and and we're not. <laughs> That the, the world isn't built that way. The, build, right. the world is built where uh, salga- salvation comes to all, including yeah. Hitler. Yeah. yeah. So that was a 19th century uh, espousal of things. And in the 20th century, they said, and we're going to interpret it for the 20th century as meaning we have a duty to, to bring these things to people on earth to the extent we can. And that's all we're supposed to do. I mean, that that's see this is this is my whole thing about like i just really have a caveat when it comes to like history because you know we have bones of humans you know millions of years old and mm-hmm. up until gebekli tepe was found just like 20 years ago we our our knowledge of history is only limited to like 7000 8000 years you know so like who are we to even who are we to even think that we can say something you know there's no there's no well, reason for pretense you know there, there there there's actually there's a lot more that we do know because i read some, uh, a researcher named penny spikens who yeah. dealt with people one two and three billion year, million years ago so they're pre-human they're, they're well, we, know, we know we 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 can find a lot about you know uh, where they live and how they you know we we, we do know some things but we don't know anything we, about the history we, we, she 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 could we don't know the history but we do know uh that, that we can infer that they cared about each other that they took care of disabled people they buried their dead they they, they buried their dead respectfully yep uh all, all the things that, that show caring and even in the, okay a quarter of a million years ago you can see there is this uh, it's a scraping stone see where you scrape meat and yep. uh, and it, it was you could do it as a half moon if you want it were a half a half circle you know um but they made it the artist the tool maker made, made it uh symmetrical in other words doubled it over on the other side so that the shape that it had uh occurred it, it's like a pear shape yeah and and then decorated they put an actual jewel jewel in the terms of a you know um, a polished stone yeah of, of yeah a quarter quarter of a million years ago they embedded that in the center mm-hmm. of, of, of this tool and so they which all of which would take a lot of extra work beyond what it would take to make a scraper so that what she's arguing is aesthetics is a cousin to compassion because instead of caring for the person directly, you're caring for, you know, giving them beautiful and encouraging, inspiring things to work with. So like my, 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 my question had always been at one point was, uh, you know, if you're hungry, where does art exist? Right. Yeah. yeah. Where, where does the aesthetic exist? But but what you're saying, what I'm thinking that I think you're right is, is that because you care. Yeah, you that's know? The, the, that's the root of everything. And, and, and social justice it has to do with because I care, I want to do something, you know, about this. Mm-hmm. And that's what Elizabeth Barrett Browning was doing. Sure. But it, you have to admit, in these days and age, it's been a little bit weaponized and politicized and heavily funded. So it's not necessarily that care. It's more uh, corporate backed, you know, uh, causes. So there's a, little, there's a little, there's a little difference. There's a little difference. I'm going I'm to argue against that with okay. one piece of evidence. Okay, and that is that it is so much easier today for any individual to start a nonprofit than it was uh, 50 years ago. Okay, sure. So, but what I'm one, trying to say, what my argument is, is thus yeah. that everything before that was nonprofit. You know, if you wanted to do something, there was not a nonprofit or a profit. It was because you cared, because you did something like, you know, I do a lot of things I don't get any credit for and I don't get any compensation for, but I do it because I care, you know, and that's that's what that's true. called living your life. It's compassion. It's compassion. You know, it's compassion. It's exactly what it is, you know, and that's that's the most most beautiful thing that people are capable yeah. of, you know. Yeah. But, but what her research showed was that it was not only beautiful and needed, but that it led to an evolutionary process of the growth of the brain in the areas of problem solving. Yeah. 
so that you could get your wish. In other words, you say, this person is suffering. I want to help them. I'm not sure how. Let me try this. Let me try that. So all of that, that trial and error started pushing the brain in an evolutionary way to get better and better, to have tools to, to, to do those things until you got, um, after another million, half a million years, you, 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 the brain had grown double the size that it was, and it was already now two thirds of the current size. Sure. So, and the title of her book was how compassion made us human. That, I mean, we didn't even know, I didn't know the title of the book, but we came to that same conclusion. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know what? I wish the best for everybody. And, you know, like I find, you know, cause you know, I've been doing a lot with the I Ching and, and a lot of, a lot of people have just these massive holes inside themselves, you know, just this, this un, unknown longing or undetermined purpose or what is life or whatever. And you can fill that with whatever you want. You can fill it with greed. You can fill it with lust. You can fill it with, you know, hatred. But if you fill it with love, then it's so much more, uh, it, it enables you to be, it, it, um, it enables you to link up with the creator and be creative, yes. you know? Yes. Because yes. It's mm -hmm. even, yeah. Because even if you're destroying, like, so destruction is a part of creation right but in yes. the process of, but in the process of destruction you typically also unless you're this you know amazing you know entity you're going to destroy yourself um no matter what because you well, can't just current, your current, current version of yourself you go from yeah. from v2 to v3 and v27 to v28 sure yeah. sure sure so i'm just trying to learn i'm trying to learn for myself as an individual because, you know, I get angry and I see all sorts. Of, and I'm not even talking about social justice. I'm just talking about social injustice. Uh -huh. And I say, I say that this is ridiculous. This, this has got to stop. This can't be, you know, we, we can't let people be treated this way. Uh, and it, 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 it enables like, uh, you know, rage or, you know, some sort of righteous, you know, in your mind, you know, righteous indignation or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of this or destroy that. Like, you know, even Bob, look, you saw how livid he was when we're going to get rid of those statues. But at the same time, like if you if you step away from that and you actually just say, you know what, everything happens, everything oh. happens. It's not in your control. And all that you can emit into the universe is love for yourself and for your neighbor. And that that's is that's I the kind agree. of energy that, that, that the creative, the creator wants you yeah. to participate in. Yeah, well, it's actually OK. Um, the same thing that uh, Emerson and um, Carl Jung, uh, people like that were saying, they're saying the creator actually sitting inside your unconscious, it, 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 it is a creator. Okay, and he's saying, and this, this resonates with the larger nature of creation in the world. We all share that same spark of divinity because we are created from the creator. Mm, probably so i'm just trying to say that that's a light in the world and the in the world of darkness you know what we need yeah. more than ever yeah. is, is that yeah. connection to that yeah. that yeah. that holy now, light well okay now jung says anytime you make a statement like that okay you got to look at it I do, should i get well. on the couch should i get on the couch <laughs> like no so not, a, right, not, okay, not okay. a couch thing not a uh, couch thing. It's, uh, a, it's a basic way of the what how is the world and your mind created yeah. not, it's not a session it's uh, it, it, it'll improve you to to know it and begin to apply it but it's not a uh a shrink um so To just catch up for a moment. Um, okay, so the un, the unconscious needs to have periodic dialogues with the conscious, but they don't talk to each other like um, in the usual way. No, it's just the 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 un the unconscious is aware of what the conscious is doing. It's, at least it's aware of the effects. That yeah. the conscious has had. And, sure. and, and monitoring to say, is it doing a good job or is it fucking up? No. Okay. And he's saying, if it's fucking up, I got to give it some help. Now, I don't know how, but I got tools and gadgets and, and, and conditions that I can throw 
in the direction of, of the ego, which is conscious, um, and to, to help the, the ego out of, out of its dilemma. Yeah. Well, because okay. it seems like the ego is in a constant state of dilemma. Well, <laughs> it's, 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 well, it's trying to be rational in a world that is not irrational. That's what I'm saying, that you can't control something you can't control. Yeah, r- right. So, yeah, um, yeah so, so then you, you, Jung says, yes, all the stuff about the holy light and, and light is where, you know, in, enlightenment uh, is and all that. He says, yeah, all that is true, but you get just as much mileage if you start from the other direction as well. Or in other words, in oscillating between the two, he says, you have to go down into the depths. So he had this dream recurring as a kid uh, of, of uh, he, goes, he goes and finds a house and he gets inside and he notices there's a stairway to the basement. And then in the basement, there's a trap door that goes down even further. He follows that and he starts seeing things from the Middle Ages and, and other periods and stuff like that yeah. and trying to make sense of it. And he has this dream periodically, even you know when, he, when he's grown up. And he makes a whole um, psychology out of it. And he finds that there are other people who thought the same way. And he begins studying the hell out of everything they wrote. So he literal, starts, the literal hell. At this yeah. point. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what I was saying earlier. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 So he does it at first with the Gnostics. And, and, that, and that's something I'm fascinated with is Gnosism. Yeah. Because the, the, those writings we didn't even have until 1957 as well, you know. We had some, but we didn't have the treasure trove. We didn't have the Nag Hammadi, you know. No, we didn't have that, yeah. No. We, had, we knew about the traditions. There were things written about it. There were, there were pieces of it, uh, but uh, we, we didn't really see the whole thing. Yeah. And, okay, and um, then he went, he stopped and he got interested in, the alchemists, because he felt they did even more. And they made it a, a conscious principle that you have to unify polar opposites. Sure. And, and so all their experiments and procedures and everything were doing things of that kind. And it turns out that there's a whole lineage going back, you know, from ancient Egypt up through the alchemists that-, that who, was, have, who, who was the big one, John, uh, or what was his name? Who was the the assistant? Hermes, uh, um, Trig, 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 Trignesis, uh Oh, well, you're going all the Hermes. way. Yeah. Okay. So you're going back to Hermetic. Uh, yeah. All right. So yeah. 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 So what's the one you were thinking about? I was thinking about the guy that was the the the, the professional astronomer to the court of Bohemia, Prague. Um, uh, what's his name? John something plus Prague, alchemist. Let's see what will come up. I, I don't know why I, my brain isn't working right now. Well, there were uh, a lot. Of John D. Left. John D. John D. Oh, last name. D E E. John D. Okay, because there's yeah. a, uh, also a, a, a Dury, John Dury, who is yeah, uh, John Dury. Yeah, the, John D. was the 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 alchemist on the court of Rudolf II uh, when he was the emperor in Prague. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah so they, young, they young would have been young would have been very well versed in his stuff. I, I, I'm sure. Yes. Yes, you indeed. Know. Yeah. Um, so, so, so Jung applied these things to a um, an approach to how to help people get better and uh, get better from something, and then get better and better of what they could be. Identifying archetypes and, and and deconstructing how you get there and, and stuff like that, right? Well, he did, yeah, he, did, he he there's four or five branches to his stuff. You know, there's uh, uh, there's even um, uh, uh, what it's called simultaneous things syn- synchronicity. Okay. Yeah. And so and we've talked about that a lot. Yeah. Over the years. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and what he's what he's saying is is that the there's an expression unis mundus, one world. In yeah. other words, the inner world and the outer world are connected and are all really one world. And they're just you know we think of them as organized you know like separately and maybe interacting, but we don't see the 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 unity in the 
polar opposites of a thing inside well, you and outside you. What is like 75% or more uh, dark matter makes up the universe? We don't even know what that is, you know? So. Okay. Now, now my, my closest um, contacts on that say that there's no proof at all of dark matter. It just, it conveniently answers some questions, but there's no evidence to actually prove that it exists. Well, I mean, that's a, a good way of also not being able to understand it at all, you know? If it doesn't exist, then it doesn't he, exist. But he, he, he claims it doesn't exist because he, okay, you want to hear this? Uh, it's up to you. It, it, it's a theory of his. I, I can make it short, but sure, he sure, thinks it's, okay. He says, there is evidence that stars are conscious. Okay, why wouldn't they be? Okay, now he's not saying that they sit around and say, "What shall I uh, watch on Netflix tonight?" But they <laughs> also saying, know they also know that if they they collapse, that everything collapses around them. Well, they may not even know that. Okay. Okay. Well, all they know is, is that they, they they are aware of other signals in in the universe that that are telling cueing them in on what is a good way to do things. Sure. Okay. And so what they do, the, the way they react to this is they speed up their orbits. Okay. So according to the laws of physics as we know them, um, these stars, you know, they have an orbit around the galaxy. They, they, this is a you know, big orbit. But, but the, the, or, the orbit, is, excuse me, the the galaxy is rotating. All galaxies rotate. Yeah. Okay. Now they rotate at a particular speed, and that's determined by and um, angle and angle and and uh, yeah or trajectory. I I'm don't sorry. know about the angle. I, I I that's beyond my knowledge. But yeah, um, I mean, me too. I'm just speaking okay. up my ass. Okay. But but, but, but <laughs> the point is, is 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 that if you measure the the speed of some types of stars. Those, those that are off on, on one end of the spectrum of, of uh, let's say, how much light uh, or how heavy they are, something like that. Okay. Those stars um, go faster than they should. Okay. So it, dark matter has been brought in in the past as an explanation. Oh, well, they, all this dark matter is pulling them and that's making them go faster. And, and I, don't necessarily he, know, but I don't necessarily know if it's pulling them. I don't know anything about dark matter other than that, you know, the, the, the philosophy of it is that everything that's not matter in the universe is something else. No, it, it, the saying that, th that this is, that dark matter is not matter. It's matter that, that doesn't give off light. Yeah, exactly. We can't see it. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, so this, this this guy who's a, a professor of physics uh, out in uh, the, the Brooklyn. Um, uh, You're saying that there's no dark matter preceding the ability of a star to to change its uh, uh, its 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 velocity. This this this, phys this physicist is saying that the dark matter is a poor explanation because it has no evidence for itself. Okay. Whereas uh, there is, uh, if you say. The, that the stars are doing this from internal consciousness. But by consciousness, you don't mean awareness of everything, but you mean volition. He uses the word volition. Okay. They 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 choose. They intend to go faster. And thus they do. Yeah, and there's various experiments and ways you can look at this, and it's been proved for our own galaxy that that the, the evidence fits for it. That explanation fits very well. And the test of the, the real test of the uh, hypothesis is to look at other galaxies. Now, you couldn't see them in the past clearly enough, but sure. now you can. Well, now with the new James Webb, we'll be able to see, and I don't know if you saw this in the news, but we've been getting radio signals we just picked up out of Australia or something somewhere, you know, I really? mean, there's also, yeah, there's, there's, there's all sorts of stuff that's coming out right now that, you know, we just didn't have the capability or we didn't have the satellite in position in the wrong, you know, or the, the antenna position in the right way or whatever. Uh -huh. yeah, we're, 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 we're uh, now uh, receiving transmissions um, from the universe. I don't know where, I can't tell you where I, I don't have the article in front of me or anything, okay. but it's so interesting that we are starting to actually receive 
transmissions now. This is so cool. No. <laughs> now, now that fits in thematically to the uh, uh, the, the star volition, star listening um, mm -hmm. hypothesis that the star could be li li listening for those kinds of signals, have the ability to to um, uh, vibrate or or otherwise Os oscillate. Yeah, yeah, and and that the the, the signals, those those signals are, are, are the um catalyst no. for, for 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 putting this whole you know th th thing into action in each star um and that's what this guy thinks uh, the physicist uh but he, he that part he doesn't know if it's true but he, but he, he, the evidence is very clear to him is is that the the, the star is choosing it, it, it's an internal rather than external uh force yeah um and and so uh, it's it fascinates me. It's and all I fascinating, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think we'll, 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 you know, I think we'll we're on the verge of beginning to understand what this whole communication system is. That that, that I mean, how things are interconnected on the large scale in the world, and that how what we do in our solar systems and things are tapping that to get the organization of of you know our cultures and. Uh, our physical you know happenings well we all are endowed with the pineal gland in the middle of our brains that they say is the radio transmitter that produces dmt that you know uh you know secretes dmt in our sleep and they say when you die your body is flood flooded with dimethyltryptamine so like you know if you were to imbibe in some of like the jungle medicine i've mm -hmm. done it myself and you go straight all the way up to the you meet the fucking aliens <laughs> And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just trying to say that, yeah, we are, are, I think it's the ego and our, our lack of ability to understand, you know, the things around us um, that prohibits us from really exploring what our true potential is. Um, our brains, anyways, or who we well, are. Well, well, you, 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 what you brought up sort of indicates, then it, it, it uh, helps explain why people, are anxious. I mean, if, if you have an awareness of your greatness or the greatness of the things around you, you know, the whole, of your of your ability. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, your, your ability and, and the universe's ability and, and, uh, in the kind of a frame, you know, like the synchronicity, you know, yeah. um, as opposed to the singularity. The synchronicity is really where the action is. How sure. does the inside and the outside uh, affect each other and how do you build a life, you know, from this? Um, so I think that our culture is going to start using that as a template, and then our, our our picture of science and religion and other things will will take a shift, you know, into a, you know put things more into focus. They'll kind of they kind of start to merge together. Yes, which is uh, that's uh, was a uh, a webinar that I went to, uh, to just one or two nights ago. Well, that's that's what's that was why I was so. It was so impactful to me to read the oldest literature that we have, the cuneiform, and to see that it was all about magic and about how to keep demons out of your house and how to prevent stomach, you know, maladies or, or to prevent bad dreams. I mean, because they were so in tune with what the humans were, you know, involved in that they knew what was going on. And we've lost a lot of that. You know, we took way we would took steps way back from that. And but this uh, is the second like, renaissance. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, well, the alchemists were really kind of the ones that started to really touch back onto that. Yeah. But now, yeah. now we have so much more information available that yeah. we should be having a, a third, fourth renaissance right now. But, you know, a lot of things are preventing that the corporate interest, media, you know, just day to day bullshit. So people are constantly just, you know, focused on fear yeah. and fear and consumption and, and whatever that they, they, they they're not really tapping into who you know what's really going on around them no no but i think that temporary stuckness temporarily being stuck yeah okay i agree and i just hope that i get to see the unstuck uh in my time <laughs> because i'd I be able to i'd be able to hug so many people and you know like oh well we finally figured it out you know but well i think it's uh the, the new normal will help 
move toward that. And and the book that I'm writing, you know, deals with um, some other of the parts of, of this, you know, how to create a society that um, that makes that helps everybody become more of their, you know, their full potential, but does sure. it in a creative and a market type of way. Or just even tap into their own genetic history, you know, I mean, yeah, their inheritance. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. You know, we, yeah, we are not we are not here on our own means. You know, we are we are products of a long time, you know, on this earth. It, 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 I was thinking that way the other day and it was. It, I won't use the word breathtaking because it was different than that. It was amazing. Yeah. You know, Amazing in the sense that it's like supposing there was something really pretty that was uh, attached to a stop sign in your neighborhood and sure. on the back of it, and you never notice that you walk by it every day. You would and never see it one day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, you see this beautiful thing, and it's there, and 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 it's obvious, and it's always been there, and it's always been there, and so yeah. you see, it's it's a that kind of amazement, like yeah. that's something that pretty and sensible you know could be actually part of your life yeah yeah and it is and it is part of your life but you're just not comprehending it you're not you're not you're not really understanding it's part of you but you're not really you're not really taking in like you said the full wonderment of of what it is um and that's where we need to really kind of move towards is is more wonder you know more yeah. excitement of, of amazing and beautiful and, and cosmic things yeah. you know yeah yeah now see now young young could do that now he felt that the thing that would lead you to it was an appreciation of um re- religious form and 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 ritual and concern uh and he felt that was taken away by the protestants which it was well, it was taken away by a lot of yeah, but yeah, sure. I mean, you know, because I've you know, if you read like the Golden Bow, you know, you, you and you look look at all the history of all the rituals of this earth, you know, and, and like the, the our, our tree alphabet, you know, like we we made our original alphabet alphabet by trees, you know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we've lost um, because it was taken from us. That was the, the 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 Gnostics were eliminated, you know. The you know all this the pagans were killed, you know. I mean all this ancient that's why that was my biggest problem when bob mcneil said something about we need to eliminate you know the past and i'm like that's what's causing so many problems if we don't have a link to we don't have a link to the understanding of all the human knowledge and human amazing amazing things that we've done we 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 don't have access to it and yeah with the internet you can hypothetically say yeah you can find it but you know finding it is 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 a a job for a seeker and most people aren't seekers you know they don't they don't go out of their way to find the truth or the knowledge. Well, you know, if, if they're put in the right situation, if they if the right things are put in front of them, then um, it their own curiosity or or self identity comes into play, and they start chasing it one way or another. They may talk to a friend about it. They may even look it up in Google. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something new on the map, but it has to, they have to care about it. We're talking about caring before That's they have true. to care. That's true. That's about true. The so see, this is the, the being a seeker is, is something that is, uh, every human being is capable of. I Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and you think about it just on a basic pragmatic level, you know, if you're hungry, you seek out food, you know, if, if, yeah, if, if, if you, if you have some sort of philosophical longing for something, then you seek out what you're looking for. <laughs> but um you know most people are just too deluded not deluded but um just there's just so much there's just so much crap out there that there's no way that you can even it's just a cl- let's just say it's a cloudy sky you know i mean we live in new york right so like a, a good example so i spent uh like four or five days out in the mountains in durango colorado and i saw all the stars and that was almost like a hallucinogenic experience. And I, and I, you know, it's sad to say that almost all of our human history had that. But you know, being in New York and being in you know these you know civilized countries, I haven't really had a chance to just wonder and just look and be amazed, you know, at at, at what's just in the sky. Yeah, it's a cl- but it's, we're living in a cloudy sky, you know, right now. But 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 there's always a trade-off. And okay, you were talking about the this the, the, the I was talking about Baruch, you know, the the the, the first uh, truly innovative uh, city, and 
Um, I mean, if you just imagine like like New York or Lagos or something else, you got sure. eight million people, you got thirty million people, yep. you got yep. all of those minds and expressions and cre- yep. creative, you know, uh, products, and, and 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 so you go to somebody who who who, who could see all the stars, and we we have our own stars, we we created them, you know. Yep. Well, yeah, but you can't see that unless you're flying over. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, but and, if, and, and if, you were fly, if you were flying on your back, you'd see the other ones. So I like, I like the ability to see both. But, you know, given given certain situations, I was just really fascinated. Uh, you know, just just wow, just the immense. It, it is something I remember once was seeing something like that. It must have, I think it was Cape Cod. Mm. Yeah. And you see it at night and it's just. Um, Endless, you know, endless is the correct answer. Yeah, that is absolutely true. And as as much as I'd like this to be endless, our conversation it will go on. And uh, I have to take care of some family business here. Sure. Uh, but uh, it's great talking to you. Love you, Herb. You're the best. And uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Okay, that and sounds you know good. What? Give your wife a hug for me. Okay. Cherish, okay. cherish, cherish your loved ones while they're still with us. Okay. <laughs> I will. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, oh, God. I got, yeah, it's uh, glad we had this conversation. <laughs> I do too. I am too. And we, yeah. we, we've we continued to have these conversations and we will continue to. So I will see you uh, soon. I'll be back in the city Sunday and uh, I hope you're well. And we'll we'll talk soon, okay? Okay, James, take, right. take care. Take care. <laughs> be yeah. well. Yeah, bye-bye. Have a good one.